December 2014. Their overall mission was to examine ways to create a stronger or more collaborative relationship between local law enforcement and their communities in which we work and play. There are six areas of focus for the task force. One is building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community policing and crime reduction, training and education, wellness and safety. Next one, please. Okay, I have to keep moving my pictures. So building trust and legitimacy. Um, uh, hold on, ladies and gentlemen, my pictures keep getting in the way. Okay. So people are more likely to obey the law when they believe that those who are enforcing it have a legitimate authority to tell them what to do. The public confers legitimacy only on those that believe are acting procedurally just ways. So building trust legitimacy between law enforcement and the citizens. And since 1990, on the average, confidence um, in policing has declined, as we all know, among the men and women of color. The pillars acknowledge that such changes could be costly, and Task Force recommends that each community reaffirms that law enforcement is legitimate and constitutionally limit authority. The task force defined procedurally just as behavior that must be practiced by law enforcement as treating people with dignity and respect, giving individuals the voice that they are encountering, be neutral and transparent in decision-making and conveying a trustworthy motives. Next one, please. So policy and oversight. Citizens have a constitutional right to freedom, of expression, including the right to peaceably, peacefully demonstrate. This area focuses on the importance of community-based policing policies governing the law enforcement practices, particularly with respect to the use of force. The policies must reflect the values of the communities in which we work. Law enforcement should have clear and comprehensive policies on the use of force. That has been a big deal um, here of late and dealing with the mass demonstrations as well. Law enforcement agencies must establish policies regarding training on the importance of de-escalation. That's another important factor. And law enforcement agencies should uh, be mandated under law to provide the public with data on the amount of officer-involved shootings, demographics those involved, as well as in custody deaths. Lastly, it is recommended that there be policies that establish um, civilian oversight mechanisms in every community to better ensure that the values of the community are being exercised by law enforcement. Next one, please. Technology and social media. The implementing of new technologies can give police departments an opportunity to fully engage and educate communities in a dialogue with their expectations for key accountability and privacy. So the task force recommends that the U.S. Department of Justice the U.S. DOJ consults with the law enforcement agency to establish national standards for the research and development of new technology, such technology that should be provided to law enforcement agencies includes less than lethal technology. Next pillar, community policing and crime reduction. Community policing requires the act of building a positive relationship with the members of the community Community policing emphasizes working with the neighbors, the residents to co-produce a public safety. Law enforcement agencies should develop and adopt new policies that reinforce the importance of community engagement in managing the public safety. And it's of great importance that the community listens to the voice of the youth in the community when making decisions. Next one, please. Training and education. The hiring of officers who reflect the community they serve is so vital and important, not only to external relations, but also to the increasing understanding within the agency. This area focuses on the need to effectively train and educate our law enforcement. Agencies should consistently train and educate officers throughout their careers, not just at the beginning. Officers must learn to be effective in social interactions. Officers must know and understand the communities in which they serve and agencies are recommended to eliminate both implicit and explicit biases when dealing with communities, especially those with higher crime rates. Next one. And the last pillar is wellness and safety. 
the wellness and safety of law enforcement officers is critical, not only to themselves, their colleagues, and the agencies, but also to the public safety, to public safety. The wellness and safety of law enforcement officers is critical for both officers and the public. The wellness and safety of officers must be a multi-partner effort because this will be a direct indication of the wellness and safety of the community. Every officer should be equipped with tactical first aid kits and anti-ballistic vests. The task force also recommends the following strategies to the US DOJ, encourage and assist departments in the implementation of scientifically supported shift lengths by law enforcement and expand efforts to collect and analyze data on officers' death as well as injuries and near misses. Those are all the pillars. Michelle? Yeah, thanks. So this, this one right here was for your information in case um, we want to go back maybe and try to look at one of the things that um, we tried to do was go on to the website to see who had, um, what other communities had adopted it. I'm not sure about you. I don't believe in recreating the um, will if we don't have to. So we just tried to um, look at um, a couple communities that was available. I'm sure there may probably are many more, but these were just the ones that we could easily um, find out. And I'm sure there's some of you on part of this committee that could help us to do that um, more efficiently. So can we go back um, to slide, um, go back maybe six slides, maybe seven, let's see. No, next one, sorry. Chris, no, no, sorry, go back. I mean, keep going, there we go. So, no, one more, one, one more. No, not that way. Sorry. Slide. I'm sorry. There's no numbers on. One more. One more. Yep. I want to get to the first one. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so if every, if we could kind of come off of it, the committee could, um, if you'd be so kind to take your, um, come off of your um, mute, really want to have some conversation and dialogue with you. Lynn, I was looking at it. You helped to distill it down. I don't know. to maybe seven, eight pages right? You just cut through the chase on what some of the recommendations and actions were right out of the plan for us. When we think about um, the charge um, of trying to formulate, which by the way, you know, the ultimate goal is to try to have some firm recommendations um, by February, because remember, whatever we come up with, we're recommending it along with the other three committees. And then ultimately the larger the committee itself will um, will um, decide and vote like on you know what's the path what out of of out of the things that all four groups recommend where do we really think um, we should really be leaning in on as a um, community as a state what's what's is the community's voice around what's really important and so that will shape the legislative agenda. Although there may be other things, right, that we come up with that are still important that we want to still figure out how to keep pushing in other ways. So today, you know, I think one of the toughest parts from my perspective, and I think Sherry's, as we talked about it, it's so much in here. Um, and I know I spent conversations with some of you to try to understand what is it we're already standing up? What are we already doing? So I really just want to open it up to your thoughts around if the six pillars, right, that we have are, are you know, do we want to focus on all six um, when we're thinking about recommendations to be able to go through? Are there a few of them that you think are more important that we got to really hone in on? Um, I'm, I want to just have some conversation and get your thoughts around that and get your perspectives as what you read or are living as it relates to the report and implementation. Anybody? Uh, Michelle, is it okay if I start? Sorry, who was who saying, is that? This is Elliot uh -huh. Margulies. Elliot. Oh, Elliot, I'm sorry, go ahead, Elliot. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. No problem. Uh, can you hear me now, okay? I can. Great. Um, so in, in looking at the uh, report on 21st century policing, um, in my mind, I felt that the first pillar as a whole is what I saw as maybe the purest um, community policing pillar um, in terms of 
emphasizing those ideals. I think that the emphasis on trust and legitimacy is um, really essential kind of from both perspectives from uh, police achieving what I, I think that uh, they want to achieve and from the community achieving what they want. Um, and that'll also, I think that that's also a pillar that um, is somewhat unique to our subcommittee. Um, there's definitely a big transparency component there, but I think it really does focus on what we want to do. Uh, within that pillar, uh, there were things that I thought were particularly important. What jumped out to me most is recommendation 1.6. Uh, and 1.6, uh, points out that uh, law enforcement agencies should consider the potential damage to, tr to public trust when implementing crime fighting strategies. And what I think is so unique about that pillar and what is so, um, and why it really encapsulates community policing is because it recognizes that there are a lot of um, things that uh, police do that have really positive crime fighting impacts, but don't necessarily take into account the impact on law enforcement's relationship with the community. Um, and we spoke a lot about that last time. What jumps out to me is uh, Corey Priest emphasized uh, policing units like Safe Streets and Governor's Task Force that may very well um, do things like take, take guns off the streets, get, get drugs off the streets, things that we absolutely want but what a community policing lens emphasizes that that's not the end of the question. We need to see what, what other impacts do units like that have on our communities and on their, um, their impression of policing as a whole. I, I, thanks for that. And you, so again, um, Lynn, I can't thank you enough. Like I could easily go to, hopefully you guys, have all printed out the information that she did send where she summarized it. So it made it really easy for me to go to um, 1.6 around the recommendation. If thank we just stay, I'm sorry. I was just saying thank you to Lynn because this synthesizes everything so well and I, it's really been a great guide. Yeah, I think it is for me. Do you have thoughts on what which one you area that you think that um, is most important or where, where we need to spend our time? For me, um, one that jumps out is 2.2.1, which is um, the alternatives to arrest um, piece. I think that is a, a critical one. I guess I should read the entire thing. Law enforcement agency policies for training on use of force should emphasize de-escalation and alternatives to arrest or summons in situations where appropriate. And I think pre-arrest diversion programs are something that, you know, many states are well ahead of where we are. You know, Newcastle County has their Hero Help Program, which is a great example of a pre-arrest diversion program. And I know this, um, uh, the state also is piloting a pre-arrest diversion program. Um, but I, I think um, we'd be well served with a lot more of that if we could um, put those kinds of programs in place throughout the state. Okay. Other thoughts? Yes, Ashley. For me, the most important, or the thing that stuck out to me was in section C 2.13, where it discusses law enforcement agencies should adopt and enforce policies prohibiting profiling and discrimination. Uh, to me, the way th that would work is by, and it's kind of touched upon here in the slideshow that confidence in policing has declined amongst men and women of color. Primarily, I believe this is in regards, regards to gangs and drugs and things like that, where police have been more overbearing and the policies in my mind should be less like a sledgehammer and more like a scalpel. If you can remove the tumor from a body, then the cancer stops spreading. But if we just try and amputate the limb as a whole, then now you're left with, a and without leaving any sort of treatment afterward, now you're left with this gangrenous infection 
that spreads to the rest of the body. Other thoughts? Thank you for sharing. I wanted to, uh, um, the one that, the pillar that most I think captures and addresses a lot of what everyone wants to do is the pillar five training and education because um, you know we want to have a better relationship, the community have a better relationship with the with the police and law enforcement. Um, and so what the action item 5.3.3 uh, in which it's obviously that's the federal government, but um, they should support encourage cross discipline leadership training, which includes you know make sure our police, law enforcement agencies and our officers, know what's out there for other, you know, as a uh, previously committee member said, you know, what's other diversion programs outside of the criminal justice system that may be appropriate for a given situation. Um, you know, being, have, make, sure, make sure the officers are informed of alternate, um, you know, areas that may be the best for community members. With that, that would increase um, so, uh, support and trust from the community with our law enforcement officers so that they see they're trying to help the community and not just, you know, uh, stats and ar arrest rates, you know, the, um, that would help bridge the gap between um, our, the law enforcement community and the community. So in anything, it starts with training um, of our law enforcement officers and not just in the beginning, they should be continued, you know, just like attorneys have continual legal education, you know, police officers should continue to have these um, education, um, and community education, uh, not just in the beginning, but as they said, throughout their whole careers. I just want to make sure I got it right. right. Were you were you doing five point nine one? I was at recommendation five point two. It's on page fifty four. Uh, okay, I see it. Five point two. Mm -hmm. I got you. I just wanted to make sure I captured it right. Thank you. Good evening, this is Corey Priest. Uh, I've been looking at action item uh, 4.2.1. Law enforcement agencies should evaluate officers on their efforts to engage members of the community and the partnerships they build. Uh, I think this is very important, you know, um, just having more community, more officers engaged in the community in a positive way um, could go a long way toward changing the culture of police departments across the, across the state. Thanks, Corey. Hi, this is uh, Monica Shockley Porter. And um, as I was uh, looking over the materials um, in the 21st Century Report, what really stuck out to me was the um, recommendation C uh, 2.1. It uh, discusses how law enforcement agencies should collaborate with community members to develop policies and strategies in communities and neighborhoods dis disproportionately affected by crime um, for deploying resources that aim to reduce crime and by improving relationships, uh, greater community engagement and cooperation. I think it's um, gonna be really vital um, that collaboration piece to make sure that you are including uh, community members in that conversation when it comes to developing policy and strategy and just making sure that you are letting those community voices know that they're valuable and that they're heard and that they're gonna be a part of that process. I think that ultimately that will help in building the trust and the legitimacy that that we've been um, talking about that's been an overarching um, theme. So just um, definitely the collaboration piece and letting their voices be heard and policy and strategy. Thank you. Does someone else? I am, hey, uh, is... oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. But I saw Josh Bushweller uh, from the Delaware State Police. Thank I just you. want to make a, um, a couple points. And first of all, Michelle, I appreciate what you said in the beginning of, of the meeting where you see where there's going to be overlap uh, amongst the four different groups within uh, the accountability task force. And just listening to some of the conversation that some of you have already brought up, I'm already seeing the overlap. Um, as far as like the training and the education, you know, there's the whole workforce development group. 
Um, so I want to make sure we stay focused on what we're trying to do with the community policing engagement. It's absolutely critical that it has to be, be done, but I want to make sure we don't try to do a lot of work that other, the other subcommittees are doing. Same with the policy development, things that sort, um, the building of trust and legitimacy. A lot of that I see also overlapping with the, uh, with the uh, transparency and accountability group. Um, for the group, I'd like to make you aware too that back in 2016, after this report was put out through President Obama's administration, I was actually part of a working group within the state police um, where we took uh, this entire report and examined all of our policies within the Delaware State Police. Um, and what I will tell you what came out of that um, is that there's 92 action items through this five pillars in this 21st century policing report. 47% of that is going to be directly responsible from the federal government. So 47% of that we don't even have to pay attention to. That leaves 43 action items from this 21st century policing report that needs to be addressed. And, and we covered this during the first meeting, but it's important to, to again reiterate this. And I understand that there's been a survey sent out to all the different police agencies to see what, if any, uh, involvement or steps they've taken with this 21st century police report. But I'm happy to report that the Delaware State Police, uh, when you come to the 49 action items that are not related to the federal government, um, we're, we're pretty much 50% complete compliance and about 40% partial compliance. Again, that's only speaking for, for, the, uh, for the state police, not other police agencies. But I'll conclude by simply saying, when you look at those six pillars from this 21st century report, pillar number four, clearly community policing um, is something we have to pay close attention to. And again, I see the, over, I see the overlapping a little bit with the tr building trust and legitimacy with our um, transparency and accountability group, but also see the training and education. Again, something critical overlapping a little bit with the work, workforce development. Yeah, thanks. I'll just add with this, so on, you know, is it the chicken or the egg on, on the overlap, right? So, I mean, I showed the, the, the circles to show that there's some work that will definitely either directly impact all of us. So I see on some things, that in order to get the community policing that, that this group recommends the stands up, it's the transparency and accountability group then to make sure, right, that it actually occurs and that, you know, that that the law enforcement is actually has a more transparent process, right? To, to make sure that they're communicating with the public on an ongoing basis. And to your point, you know, it's the same thing I would say on the workforce because no matter what we do, the workforce is such a such an integral part because we need the right culture of the ten, of the law, of our law enforcement officers to stand up all of it. So like there is this overlap, but I don't think it just sits in one bucket anywhere. I think there's some things and maybe, you know, that's those are the things that ultimately that get recommended are the things that maybe that do touch all four areas, right? That are intentionally um about that, but thanks for sharing. I do have a quick question for you since you um, opened this up. So out of the 92 action items that you said, you noted that 47% of them are federal government related. Maybe, um, Lynn, I'm throwing this out there with you again. At some point, we might be able to um, get some feedback from you outside this meeting on what, what you know, which one of these, right, uh, that you're talking about that we can asterisk it or something start so that we know that you know, or, or re-sort the, the data so we have it, but the other 53% then, right, you, because I'm, I'm curious as to, Lynn, are you raising your hand to say that this yeah. is represents so the, the list that I sent out, I already deleted the ones that were the federal agency okay. related. So those were, have already been deleted from the set that I sent out. Thank you, Lynn. See, you're already uh, ahead of it. So, so the ones that we think are in here, if there's some things in here that you think that we missed that um, are related to the federal government, that would be good to know because these are the ones then that we think do have a local impact. Hey, hey Michelle, can I build on that a little bit? You can. So to Josh's point and to your point about the circles, uh, Within our subcommittee, when we're talking about community policing and engagement, 
and, and this first pillar of building trust. Much of the way I see it is you build trust through transparency and accountability. So we have this other subcommittee where that's their title, but honestly, that's not what they're gonna be working on. That, that subcommittee is gonna be working on civilian review boards, qualified immunity, law enforcement officers, bill of rights. When I'm talking about transparency and accountability to build trust, I'm talking about agencies need to have good policy in place. And those policies need to be transparent. So policies should be posted on agencies' websites so that the community can see them. Um, with those good policies, it's important for agencies to be accredited. So we have a Delaware Police Accreditation Commission, uh, but not all agencies in the state of Delaware are required to be accredited. So we don't know what kind of policies they have in place because they're not part of the accreditation program. Body-worn cameras is another part of accountability, early warning systems to make sure that officers are doing their job. Like in, in many of the larger agencies, we have this early warning system so that if an officer is involved in you know, a force situation one week and then they're involved in a pursuit situation the next week and then a citizen's complaint is made, there's, a, there's an alert. So their supervisor's made aware of that. So they're, they're the things I think that we need to work on for community policing and engagements to build trust is that kind of accountability and transparency. You know, the idea of utilizing your website for policies are great, but there's other things uh, that agencies, you know, that we can make a recommendation coming out of this task force. And some of the things that police chiefs council is already committed to, like, you know, we're in support of accreditation, we're in support of body worn cameras, we're in support of early warning system. Uh, we're in support of agencies to participate in the police foundation's open data portal so that we can publish use of force per agency. And I think it's important when we do that, that we mandate all agencies to collect use of force data the same way. If I'm collecting use of force data one way and another agency is collecting it another way, the numbers aren't, aren't going to uh, line up. And, and, and what, I, what I'll give you an easy example of that. In my agency, if, as, if an officer draws their weapon we use that as a force, a use of force, or if they draw their taser, it's a use of force just for the display of it. Where another agency, unless you actually deploy the firearm or the taser, they might not count that as a use of force. So I think it's important that we're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges, and we should be transparent. Community outreach, employee demographics, citizens complaints, internal affairs complaints, all those kind of things would help build trust through that transparency and accountability. And the Police Chiefs Council has already supported this. I've, I've shared a document with Michelle and I'd, I'd be happy to share it with all of you. You just Google uh, Delaware Police Chiefs Council, you'll see our commitments uh, to accountability, transparency, community outreach, training and those kind of things on there. So I think that you know, we're, we're focusing on community policing and engagement, but a huge, that huge first pillar, pillar is building trust and legitimacy. And I think you do that through transparency and accountability. So I don't think that we should be, we should shy away from looking at transparency and accountability just because there's another task force that, or another subcommittee that has that title. Because as I mentioned earlier, I think they're going to be looking at different things. They're going to be looking at civilian review, qualified immunity, and Leobra. They're not going to be looking at being transparent as departments and, and being accountable as, de as departments. Yeah, those are all really good um, points. Question for you is um, the things that you identified and the things I know that you gave in the report, do some of them directly translate where we could like, I could tick them off in, in here as to the recommendation? When, when, we, when we built that document, we weren't specifically looking at the, at the um, 21st century policing document, but absolutely you could go through. Like I, when Lynn sent out the, her summary, I was looking through and I was kind of like, yep, we already do that. We already do that. Yes, we can agree to that. Um, so I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit here that we can grab a hold of so that when we get to the point where we're making recommendations um, and, and a lot of it, I'm going to be able to tell you from the police chief's standpoint that we've already talked about it. We've already agreed to commit to Right. So this, let me ask you this before anyone else, before if anyone else wants to say something, but was there one of these on here that, that you think that we need to pay attention to most? Um, 
I, I think it's important for agencies to have good policy, good procedure, good supervision, and good training, uh, most definitely. The challenging part is, is that it's it's all scalable. So when you cut, you know, so when you when you consider a large agency like the state police, they have lots of resources in place where they can pull uh, troopers off the street and conduct training and, and put together good training courses and and things like that. And smaller agencies, you know. When, the, when an officer has to be pulled away for training, it, it's difficult. I mean, the town only has so much money, they have to pay another officer to, to cover, you know, overtime to cover the shift while they're doing training. So I think when we, when we talk about training, we need to embrace the technology that's available to us and start looking at options so that we can do training remotely. You know, at three o'clock in the morning, uh, when there's not many complaints coming in, that's a great time for a police officer to sit somewhere in a high visibility area. So citizens see the car and while they're sitting there, they can look at their computer and do some training as opposed to the, the model that we have in place now of training. Oh, training means you, you're not working and you go somewhere else for eight hours and you go to training. We can break up training in smaller segments of 15 minutes to an hour and the officer can do it in their car while they're sitting in a high visibility area. They're deterring crime while they're out there because they're a visual deterrent. Uh, they're available to citizens to come up to. They can hook, you know, hit stop on the video and those kind of things. So I think we just need to think outside the box a little bit with, uh, with training. But, but as I mentioned earlier, I think the most important things are agencies have to have good policy and procedures in place. They have to have good supervision. They have to have good training. And as you do those things and, and you're transparent with it, I think that's going to uh, help to build trust and legitimacy. Okay, thanks. Allison, I'm sorry, you were going to say something. So I guess I'm, I am zeroing in on C1.2. Law enforcement agencies should acknowledge the role of police in past and present injustice and discrimination and how it is a hurdle to the promotion of community trust. So if we're talking about building public trust, increasing the legitimacy of police with the communities that they serve, you know, you can roll out all of these initiatives and start all these programs, but I think first there needs to be just a general acknowledgement of the part that policing has played here. And, and to all the police officers in this subcommittee, Please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know that there has been that public acknowledgement. And I think it's really, really important to people because it legitimizes their gripes, their concerns, their fears, their hopes, and it makes people feel heard. Um, and I think that, that that apology or that acknowledgement could be such a great jumping off point for for all of the work that we're trying to accomplish here. I, I don't think you can paint it with that wide of a brush, but when there are incidents, I think like with the, with the George Floyd incident, police agencies across the country have come out and, and said that they were sickened by that incident. I mean, the police chief's council here in Delaware, we posted a statement about that incident to acknowledge that that was terrible uh, and that the officer should have been arrested and he was arrested. So. It's not always easy to paint that wide brush to say like, you know, uh, we want to, if, if, you know, you, you have to, each incident's individual is what I'm saying. It's not, not easy to just paint a wide brush and say that we should come out and acknowledge uh, injustice. If there is injustice, absolutely. We're, we're, we're in the justice business. We don't want injustice out there. Um, and for different specific incidents, obviously you will have uh, police departments come out and, and make a statement about them beginning to think this is like a bingo game. Um, <laughs> who else wants to be able to chime in on where they think, right? Um, can, I, can, I just, can I just tell you a quick quick story about something that happened here recently and why uh, these body-worn cameras are so so important? You sure can. We, we, we had an incident just this past week on, on campus where uh, two young, young students were waiting for another friend to come out of the dorm and they stopped in the middle of the street and they put their flashers on. And we happened to have an officer in the area and the officer didn't know what they were doing, walked up to them casually to ask them if he could help. As he was approaching the car, there was radio traffic on his police radio and that, that 
radio has a microphone going right up to his ear. So it's difficult for police officers to talk to people when they got radio traffic blaring in their ear. So he used his left hand and reached down onto his, his gun belt where his radio is and adjust the volume on that radio while he was talking to those students. Students said they were waiting on a friend. The friend was approaching at that point. The officer turned around, saw the friend. They really, that never even broke stride. Gave him a thumbs up, turned around and walked away. In those students' minds, that officer walked up and put his hand on his weapon. And I really believe they believe that's what happened. The video clearly shows he's right-handed. His gun was on his right side. He never touched his weapon, never came anywhere near his weapon. He was adjusting his radio. But sometimes things happen and, and people perceive it in a way where it just didn't happen. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, that complaint could have without that video could have taken on a life of its own. So it's hard, it, you know, sometimes we see things out there, we hear about things out there, and we, sometimes we have to wait till we vet everything out. Uh, so again, I think building trust, you know, and, and, and then on the other side of that, when you have the video camera and the officer does something wrong, like in the George Floyd case, that's great too, because nobody wants to weed out the bad cops worse than the good cops. Yeah, but I also think like the underpinning part of the story is that their perception is that there's probably was already some undertone of mistrust for whatever reason, right? As you said, like just for the, from a legitimate perspective. I do have a question though. And so that's just why we just, you know, I think there's the bridge that still needs to be built, right? Between law enforcement and the community. My, my question for you in that case, do you then post that out to the public, because I think you know you were saying like it through your accreditation process. How how does the community now get to have access or to be able to see that? So on our website, we would count that as a citizen's complaint uh, that would be unfounded. Um, I think that's how we classify it, unfounded. Um, but yeah, so so we track all that and we publish that information out on our website and we follow up with the students. Obviously, you know, we 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 contacted them and explained what happened, told them they're well, you know, more than welcome to come in and watch the video and those kind of things. But uh, you know, I think kind of the important part is is that I don't think those students made that up. I think they really believe that right. that, that officer had his hand on his weapon. So I think that's kind of the breakdown that we need to bridge that gap. Yeah. Yes, that was a great example, right? No, I'm sorry, just one of the questions I was trying to understand. So do you actually post the video on the on your website or you just post the findings? We just post the finding. Okay, so. okay. Anyone else wants to be able to weigh in that we didn't hear from? I can't see all of you. Michelle, can I add one more? And this is Elliot Margulies. Elliot, you sure can. Thank you. Um, 4.5.4 action item. Um, I'll read it. Uh, law enforcement agencies should adopt community policing strategies that support and work in concert with economic development efforts within the community. Um, I think that uh, this action item has uh, two points of value. Um, number one, it, it gives, I think, policing agencies an opportunity to really support the community in a positive way, which um, I know that that's something that they want and that's something that will establish the positive relationships. Um, and then it also forces us all to um, recognize the impact that law enforcement can have um, on, on the economy and specifically in low income areas, um, how specific practices can um, exaggerate poverty and have lots of collateral consequences for the people being policed. Um, what number did you pick again? I'm sorry. This is action item 4.5.4. Um, oh, okay, I see it. Thank you. This wasn't bolded. Yep. Any other feedback, thoughts from anyone that we didn't hear from? Lynn, I know you like waiting to, to, to tag you in. You're on, um, your, your speaker is on mute. Oh, um, Sorry, look, go ahead. 
That's okay. This is Monica Shockley Porter again. Um, looking at um, item 4.3.2, I guess working in mental health, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the importance of uh, peer supports. Hold on, it looks like the screen changed. So I need to be able to read um, the item. Sorry about that. All right. So um, can you give, about, me, Monica, can you give that number again, please, ma'am? Sure, that's okay. It's um, 4.3.2. Communities should look to involve peer support counselors as part of the multidisciplinary uh, team when appropriate. Persons who have experienced the same trauma can both provide insight to the first responders and immediate support to individuals in crisis. So I think when we talk about two um, instances of um, you know mental health crises and also um, other um, instances where peer supports may be valuable. I think that's another way um, to to just uh, be able to support and build trust within community. Um, it's really important to have that peer um, available. And I know that in Delaware, you know, there's been a lot of action around um, having peers and also having um, social workers and counselors ride um, with the officers as well. So I thought that was a really um, good point to make as well as far as the action items. Okay, yeah, that and actually I've um, in the in the presentation at the beginning, right? Um, it's part of the charge. I think the trauma piece was in there, right? It's uh, to increase crisis intervention services and ongoing proactive mental health care. It was actually talking about for police. And, you know, when you read this, I don't think it just means for police as they getting services directly, but I think it's kind of police training, right? So that is a good one, um, Monica. I told you we're just playing bingo here. Pretty soon we'll have every um, one of them. Anyone else have any feedback? I may one more time, another one, um, you know, we have to know who is our community, you know, community policing, it's not just law enforcement, it's also recognizing who's in our community. The community in Delaware has changed over time. Um, and so that's why uh, I think recommendation uh, 1.9, law enforcement agencies should build relationships based on trust with immigrant communities, with central to overall public safety, and then there's uh, additional action items because we have to recognize in the state of Delaware, the immigrant community has, has shot up uh, both up and down the state, both uh, in Newcastle, uh, Sussex, and um, to an extent Kent as well. And we've seen the, the lack of, you know, uh, the, the terms of reaching out to law enforcement agencies when crime does occur. You know, um, there's police uh, uh, departments in, in, in Sussex County who's tried to, you know, help with bridging the gap with um, uh, Hisp Hispanic um, police department, uh, police officers like in Georgetown. And we wanna you know, add that up and down the state. So we also have to look at who's in our community and how do we best address them, not just the Hispanic community, but the African-American community, um, everyone who's, who is our community. That's a great point. Anyone else? Lynn, I know we haven't heard from you. Yeah, I'll go back to 1.3.1, um, which is talking about, you know, not only all department policies available for public review, but also regularly posting on the department's website information about stops, summons, arrests, reported crime, and other law enforcement data um, segregated with, by demographics. Um, and I guess, Chief Ogden, do you know if that, um, data is already available and just not being posted publicly, or does it not even exist in the form that they're describing here? Sorry, I missed the beginning of that, but which data are you looking for? So that would be, um, let's see, information about stops, summonses, arrests, reported crime, and other law enforcement data um, segregated by demographics. Again, that's agency specific. So that, that might be a very good recommendation to come out of this subcommittee that we do that. So uh, bear with me. I look at this from two different lenses, okay? So I spent 22 years with the state police. I've been here in university policing for 11 years. We do things much differently here than we did there. Uh, and, and our complaint load is a lot less. So it's a lot easier, but like 
those kind of things, a lot of the things that are bring, being brought up, campus police agencies across the country are already doing this. We, we, we embrace uh, transparency like, like nobody's business. I mean, every day we put our daily crime log up, post it on the internet. You can see you know, what, what crimes occurred on the university campus. Uh, whenever there's a serious crime, you know, we're sending notifications out to the community and every single interaction that one of our officers gets involved with, they collect that information, um, the person's name, their age, their, their sex, their race, and their affiliation with the university. And then at the end of the year, every year we compile that information and we could probably do it more often if we wanted to. But once a year, we update that information to our website so that you can look. Uh, and, and, and the goal of it is, is to make sure, and, and generally it is pretty close, we want to make sure that the people that we're coming into contact with closely mirror the community that we serve. I mean, that, that's, that should be the goal of that. Um, so in our case, it's very easy. Um, in but our as case, the police chief councils, do you have a sense of how many of the other you know, 48 jurisdictions also collect and have that data that they could share if we ask them for it? I, I don't know, but I, I can find out. Thank you. It, Captain Bushweller's on, Josh. I yeah. don't know if anything's changed since I retired, but are you, sure. are you guys sure? Yeah, that that's, um, yeah, with the Delaware State Police, we, we, we do that on an annual basis. We release annual reports as far as our traffic arrests, our, our stop, traffic stop data, criminal arrests, um, complaints, types of complaints. Um, so we are producing those types of statistics. I wouldn't say it's a regular basis, we do it on an annual basis. And is that avail Is that report available to the public? It is, it's on the website, okay. sp.delaware.gov. And then I, I have to look into it, the chief might know, but our State Bureau of Identification um, or our Delgis, right. um, Delaware, uh, Delaware Criminal Justice Information Systems, they, they also probably put out some types of annual reports that has that type of data. So, so, Two different things. So what I was talking about is we document it for everybody that we come into contact with. The information that you're going to be able to get from Delgis that we could pull is just from tickets. Right. So that won't tell you about contacts that they come into contact with where somebody was released with a verbal warning. Correct. Right. So the one is have and do is there information, Chief Ogden, that your group already looks at, like as a state, that you might that might be helpful to this group. That you may already have. Um, yeah, I don't know because, like, like I said, everything that we could pull from the state would be. So we're fortunate in the state of Delaware that there's one report writing system, one ticket system, and one crash report system for all agencies in the state. So we're all submitting it in through Delgis. So any any arrests that are made, we can pull that information fairly well. The problem is, is, as I said, is the ones where you don't do a report on, you might come into contact with somebody and they're, you know, they're given a verbal warning and sent on their way, which honestly happens a lot. Um, so you're only going to capture the ones where there's arrest, but we, we could certainly pull that information from Delgis, but you wouldn't have the, the documentation of the, the people who are, you come into contact with who are not issued a ticket or unless they're issued like a, a written warning or something like that. But in that sense, I feel like this subcommittee has an opportunity that we may not have again to put out a request to all these jurisdictions to um, you know, compile that data and, and provide it. So even those that currently are not, you know, we could ask them to provide it. You mean like provide it like make it available just to the public you're you're saying as one of the recommendations so it's always available from every jurisdiction no. legislatively we could work towards having all jurisdictions on a regular basis post it publicly yeah yeah that, that that's right. what I, that's where i was just trying to clarify right no i mean right now we as a task force subcommittee could request access to data that isn't currently being made public or maybe even compiled in the the, the, only, the only sense of caution that I would give to that is you got to be careful because if you put extra work on the police, like capturing data like that, they might take on the philosophy that every person I stop is getting a ticket now because I got to fill out the information anyway. 
and and you certainly don't want to go go right. down that route. Right, right. No, no, we don't want any unintended consequences. <laughs> it, to, to that point, real quick, it's, it's um, it's Josh Bush, Oregon State Police. Well, our troopers are required to do to fill out a data collection form on every pedestrian or vehicle stop or contact that they have, regardless of the outcome, whether it be a, a warning or a citation. I just wanted to get that. Yeah, because um, I thought that at one point we were talking about that the warnings were also just in case we wanted to look at were certain demographics disproportionately given warnings versus other tickets. Right. Can I, I have a follow-up question for uh, Officer Bushweller and Chief Ogden. Go for it. Um, I, I think if, if I understood what Lynn was asking and, and that uh, recommendation, it was specifically about um, making uh, demographic immigration, uh, dem demographic information available is what you guys were saying that you currently have race specific demographic information about your arrests available on your websites? We, we do at the university. As, as we do as well when it comes to our traffic stop data. Gotcha, thank you. I think what Lynn's point was uh, maybe all 48 do not, and we could request that information, but you know, I think there's some caution to the wind around that. And maybe even more importantly, do we wanna legislate it, which I think that's what 1.31 potentially is alluding to, right? If we find that this really is important. So if anyone, has anyone not spoken, cause I'm just gonna try to, we got a couple more slides we gotta get through and then we got some decision-making we need to make. Um, has, did, has everyone spoken? Is there someone who has not shared that we want to make sure your voice is also in the process? I can't tell. I haven't spoken yet, but a lot of what I was going to share has already been touched upon by Wilson and by Lynn and by others on the committee. So I'm, I'm in agree agreement with all of them. Okay. Right. Same, same here. This is Rita Page. Hey, Rita. Hello. Reginald, did you speak? I can't. Yes. Okay, you're good. Okay, I'm just trying to, it's hard for me to get a picture of everyone the way that these screens are set up. So one of the things that, um, I mean, we came up with several things, but not a hundred things. So one of the things that maybe that we can do um, is to recap these on the ones that you picked. And maybe what we'll do as a next step is have you really like reread them, think about them, and I'll probably ask you to rank them, right? And so we'll start with what's here. And then if you, when you go through, if you think of another one, we'll throw that into the mix for next time. But I will send out, work with you to send out the ones we have and said, if these are the things that as a group, as of today, right? As of like, you know, October 13th, um, that we think are the important ones to be able to focus our energy around. I'm going to ask that you rank them. So even if it wasn't the one that you picked um, as the first, um, so I'll probably do a couple of different rankings. Have you, if there's 20 things, I'm gonna have you do one through one through whatever. And then I'm going to ask you to just really to step away from them, come back, rethink about them some more. And if we could only, you know, go for, um, I don't know what number I'm going to pick, three or five. I'll talk to Sherry about this. Like, which ones then that says you absolutely want to make sure that's in? Okay. I have a question in terms of whether we're also going to consider things outside of the 21st century policing report that we think would be important for building trust in the community. You know, we've talked about the need to reduce overly aggressive um, tactics that are used. And I think, for instance, the Safe Streets and Governor Task Force does kind of fit under the um, one of the things that uh, was brought up earlier. But I'm not sure um, uh, the civil asset force picture fits neatly under one of these, but I think it's still something that this subcommittee probably needs to address. Um, and there may be some other examples like that. And the question is, are we able to put those on the table as well? Or are we limiting ourselves to what's in the 21st century report? 
gosh, don't you think that was a lot? Oh my goodness. So no, we can open, <laughs> look, I'm like, oh my goodness, add one more thing. But no, actually, if there are other things that you think we should consider, like the one you had, if that's gonna be your vote, clarify it for me. I, I don't like the idea, like with this, we can't put stuff in the chat, right? So I, I don't wanna capture it. So, so can you just restate again? Civil asset forfeiture. Right. So, I mean, can, is that like, but what specifically, like if we were going to try to put this in a statement for people to vote on around a policy change, what are you, can you just put it in a quick sentence? Uh, that we want to um, put limits on how um, civil asset forfeiture is, is now implemented. Okay. We will add that too. So you bring up a good point. Is there anything else that you think that we should be thinking about um, including? Because these are just the broad, right? To be able to, to get us to kind of to narrow down where are there other things? I will add that. It will be a, it'll be our own, right? A D, we're gonna make it a D for D E. I think we need to recognize that we can't police our way out of the gun violence issue. And I think part of what um, our charge was in terms of engaging the community more in public safety would include helping to launch and sustain community-based violence intervention programs, which again, have been proven to be effective throughout cities across the country um, and that we should be funding and doing more of that in Delaware. I'm sorry, community-based, say it again, please. Community-based violence intervention programs. Well, at the end of the day, you really can't legislate trust either. I mean, like we are saying how critical it is, right? But it isn't what it says. It's, it's almost like, um, which I can appreciate and, um, Chief Ogden's re, um, report out and conversation with us that said that the chiefs, you know, a lot of them, you know, or, or the collective we are already supportive of a lot of this, right? These are changes that we're already trying to be able to make as a state. And I do think, Chief Ogden, we might want to look at some of the things that you're already working on to, to see if it translates to something that's not on here that we may think that is important that the chiefs are already trying to do, um, pushing to be able to, you know, and what we'd like to see implemented that don't align up to one of these, we can go back and just do that quick test too when I send it out. Absolutely. May I ask a question? You um, sure can. Particularly of Lynn, she mentioned about reducing overly aggressive tactics. Would you think that would flow more on the commute on the subcommittee that's dealing with the use of force and imminent danger versus for no because for instance this civil asset forfeiture is not really use of force but it's still considered by many overly aggressive uh same thing with you know safe streets and the governor's task force it's not necessarily use of physical force right but it's again overly aggressive in terms of um searching folks who are not right part of that so so were you merging the two together reducing overly aggressive tactics and civil um, asset and forfeiture were you merging them together or there are two separate points they're, they're two separate problems they're both just examples of what i think are overly aggressive tactics but they're two separate things Okay. I think there too, we, we just we just have to be careful. I mean, you know, it's one thing for uh, the police to stop somebody and they, they seize, you know, their property because of X, Y, and Z. It's another thing that when, you know, there's an investigative process that takes place and you can clearly articulate that this person is involved in illegal activity and that's how they support themselves. Uh, I think it's, I don't think it's overly aggressive to seize their, their assets of their illegal activity. Um, I agree with Chief Ogden in those situations, doesn't seem overly aggressive. The problem is that Delaware law and police policy currently allows seizing of assets in 
um, situations far outside that. So what we'll do is we'll add it, right, to the <laughs> list, and then, you know, we'll vote on it and see where it falls in the process. So we're going to, so it's a kind of begin to move us forward a little bit. We're going to, this was really good. We will put this in uh, um, communications to you, ask you to rank them, vote them again, have you kind of rethink. I just realized, Chief Hogan, we need to go back, look at, you know, the information that the Chiefs already came up with, make sure there's nothing else right we want to include. And I will allow a write-in. So if there's a couple of things that you forgot about that you want to write in, now mind you, when you're voting, it'll only be on yours, but we'll figure out how to incorporate it in for the next go around in case anyone has any ideas um, that we need to be able to just to try to keep in front of us. Does that sound like a path forward? Gosh, this was a good way to get all Sounds like a plan. I want to see how we can quickly get through such a complicated document. When you read it, it really isn't all that complicated. It's it's pretty simplistic. It's probably it's um, easier said than done, right? As we vote to be able to um, to do these. So let's go. I'm going to transition. I'm going to close that out, right, for the path forward with this. Can we take us to slide? Are we still having problems with the PowerPoint? If we are, I just read it. If we're not, if we can advance. No, we're up. good. This is Alexa. We're good. Okay, Alexa. Can, can you go down to the slide that says "Let Voices Be Heard"? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. There we go. So the one thing that really struck, I'm Sherry and I for last time that we heard was people kept saying, we remember we got in this whole conversation around making sure that we're really getting the voice of the community. We made it clear. It wasn't just about getting the voice of Wilmington. It was about getting voices of all Delaware citizens from the top to the bottom of our state, right? Or should reverse it. Like Sussex, why can't Sussex be the top, right? And, you know, we just kind of going backwards for Newcastle County. But how do we make sure that um, all that a diverse group of community stakeholders. So I actually was just thinking about this earlier. And um, so in, in my little, in my, in my head, I'm trying to envision it's, we have these 48 different law enforcement agencies that make up our community of Delaware. And so I was talking to Lynn today. I don't have the skill set. Got to figure out if anyone on this group has it or we know where to get it. I really wanted to map I don't know, do you ever have this um, Chief Ogden somewhere with the chiefs? I really wanted to map the 48 law enforcement and then kind of draw some circles around stuff that made sense, right? So, you know, like usually people doing stuff in the Middletown, Odessa, Townsend area. You know, we did stuff in Laurel, Seaford, Bridgeville. You kind of draw a circle around that. Like, what are the common areas? So maybe the 48 become, I don't know, 12, 15 different kind of communities. Maybe it's more than that. I don't really know. But one of the things I wanted to, that I hope is that when, that we really need to hear the voice of the community. We want to make sure that we've had listening sessions within those bubbles, right, of common communities. And one of the, the, the thoughts that I had, um, or I should say Sherry and I had, and I, I don't know if we talked about it a little bit from this meeting, um, last time, or you guys just gave us the idea, which is what if this group did some divide and conquer and those who, who so wish, and we sent this to you already in an email, that if you be willing to facilitate conversations, um, listening sessions, and I know that the group has had some panels, and I'm not talking about a panel where we're talking to people, I'm talking about we share with people um, if it's through Zoom, a couple of slides about what is community policing, I mean, you know, and engagement look like so that maybe we can standardize the definition or if we're having it with people in person or without Zoom, that we at least are starting from us the same base of what we mean, even if people's conversations go elsewhere, but really to be able to hear from the, the community as to what does this mean to them, what would success look like, we might be able even, um, so we really, cause we want to kind of engage the community. I actually was thinking um, if we were close to maybe even framing, which timing probably doesn't align up to what we're thinking about kind of getting people's reaction to it. But we really just want to be able to hear 
so that people can't come back and throw a dart that said they're not going to participate on the Zoom meeting, you know, from six to eight tonight, you know, it's going to be limited. And so how do we do a better job of letting people know that we want to hear their voice, that their voice matters? Um, I think, I can't remember who said this earlier about legitimizing, right, people and allowing them an opportunity to be heard in the process, which is important. So the thought process was we could do it through community-based organizations. We could do it through faith organizations. You could do it through um, other groups that are already happening in the community. I know I reached out to a couple of groups who are already meeting with people, there's Lynette in here, that, um, that said they'd be willing to um, do some listening sessions with the community. But I really, instead of it just being, um, we throw it out and we get some, but we don't know if it's really gonna cover the whole state. I think we should kind of be intentional or have some intentionalities of trying to make sure that we're hearing it from pretty much the broader group of what we're hearing. So that's one, that's one step. And then whoever is really great at data on our team that who wants to synthesize the results of here's what we heard and help us to develop it into some themes and then use that to align to some of the areas that we think are important, right? You know, does it line up or doesn't it line up? And are there some other things that we should be taking into consideration? So that's kind of like the path forward I'm thinking on the community voice. Um, so the thought process is, can you just go to the next slide? Cause I just maybe might help you guys to think through what I'm thinking. So in October, which we're in October. So between October and November, it's trying to figure out how do we get as much community voice as we can into the process um, in November. And can we get more law enforcement? So at this meeting next time, we would like to invite some of the chiefs to the meetings to kind of to have a panel discussion with them to hear their voice in the process. We can't get to all 48, um, but we'll try to get a good representation again from the circles right, that we'll try to create of the bubble um, and of, of all sizes. And then we also want to try to hear from some law enforcement officers themselves. And so we really kind of want to think through how do we host some meetings with officers um, to get their views and perspectives in this, because we want it to be a broad-based community win across the board, if we can. And then in December, then this is when we start to really kind of analyze data, see if we can develop themes, draw some um, share results with this group, maybe draft our preliminary public policy agenda. What does it tell us? What, what still don't we know? Where are there discrepancies? Where's there gaps that we can kind of identify? So that in January, maybe we can go back to, out to the community that we listen to share with them, here's what we're thinking of our findings, give them some a chance to react to it, revise and edit our agenda. Um, and then in February, maybe have some final recommendations. Because when we have to come up with recommendations, then it has to go remember to the larger committee so that they have a chance to prioritize it, vet them and alike. And so that's like, I'm trying to get us to, um, it's a pretty aggressive timeline um, but if I want to try to get us focused around this. So what's your reaction? Don't all react at once. You know, I would say that there do, is October enough time to really get back the voice of the community because we're already halfway through October. So should October, we, November. you know, should we be able to either, like you said, merge it into November or mm -hmm. push things back a month. Yeah, that's a good point. So really it's kind of, it was meant to be, only I did it like this, that voice of community should carry over also into November to your point. Okay. And we're already kind of getting the voice of law enforcement. So really both of them could kind of be in October, November, but you know, kind of being really intentional about that, but you bring up a good point. So it allows us, you know, we're sitting here again on the 13th, you know, allow, we want to try to maybe try to get it done maybe before Thanksgiving, if we can be intentional about getting that. So at the beginning of December, 
right? We can begin to kind of analyze data. So then we meet again, which is I think like the second week of December, the date's already set it, you know, we'd have some something to this group to react to. So that's a great point. I totally agree. Any other thoughts? Michelle, this is Elliot. I have a question or a, maybe a suggestion about the voice of law enforcement. Um, we have, I think a lot of people have made the point that we don't want to reinvent the, the wheel here. I thought it maybe it would be helpful to get representatives of some of those law enforcement agencies that you mentioned at the beginning that have um, already adopted a lot of these um, policies. I think Camden is usually held out as a great example. Um, I would love to hear what has worked for them, what has not worked for them. I think that would be valuable to everyone here. Yep, I agree. So I'm going to try to get them, you know, and um, Chief Ogden, maybe you can help me to identify, um, you know, who we think really should be um, on the panel. Okay. When you say Camden, you mean Camden, New Jersey, right? You want to get agencies from outside the state? That's what I have in mind. OK. Yeah. And Michelle, also in terms of um, December analyzing data, um, I was wondering, unless we have somebody um, on the panel who has um, real professional and educational data analysis background, would it be helpful to have somebody that does have a statistical analysis background. I don't know what type of data we're gonna be getting, but if it's um, a huge number from, of data points from 48 police agencies, I just wonder if um, we're gonna be able to put it into a um, readable and understandable um, format. Context yeah, so really for this, just uh, what I was really thinking that data would be would be qualitative data that we would be hearing from the voices of the community in October and November, but that can be just as like um, challenging, right, to be able to get, I know we have Yasser um, on the group, he's not here tonight, and I know he does that piece, but I don't know if there's others, but that will be one of the things that maybe I'll also try to figure out. We did this early on trying to um, ask all of the members to complete a survey to let us know where you thought your strengths were, like where you thought you could help. But we might need to dust that off, Elliot, to your point to see what we have. And then if we don't have that skill set, then I'll have to work with Frank and Daryl to see if um, we can um, find out that resource for us. Because the other thing that I was actually thinking that might be helpful, I don't, not to deter us, right, from going forward, but if when we even got to December and had some preliminary thoughts around we have, I don't know um, how do we figure out if there's a fiscal note attached to this or not even just fiscal, you know, like the, I don't, is this something that the you know legislators are going to legislate and then they're going to find funding to be able to do it because you know like th there's a cost associated with a lot of these and so it would also be helpful just from our own perspective to really to understand what that is and what that looks like not that we wouldn't suggest it but i at some point like we're going to need to try to understand that because I don't know if that would change even how, when we finally get to the final recommendations, if something sounds like it's a great idea, but it just has such a huge price tag with it. If, if it's just not unrealistic, that might not be the top thing then that we vote for. So you, you said that when you, that December's analyzed data, what you had in mind was the qualitative data that we're kind of sourcing from community and law enforcement input. Yeah, I'm Are, hoping that some of the um, the other data we pro we should be able to have some of the other data too, um, Elliot. Maybe some of that we might be able to bring to the November meeting that we have that's available. Right, we can begin again. I think you know, as the point that was made earlier, we don't have to wait all the way to get to December to get to some of the data analytics. I did have some stuff. I heard Chief Agnes said there's some stuff that's online that's available. There's some website stuff. So maybe we could try to pull as much of that as we can to look at 
and then figure out like, what else do we really need to know? And I really do challenge us on what is it that we really think we need to know to make a decision. There may be things for stuff we're doing outside this group that we're thinking, oh, we could use that information for, but I'm really talking about data for our decision-making. Thanks. If that makes sense. So is this, Hi, this is uh, Monica Shockley Porter again. When we go back, um, I just wanted to take a step back to um, the October, November voice of the law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the Smyrna Police Department has been doing a lot around um, mental health and actually having clinicians out in the community with their officers, as well as I know that they were one of, if not the first, one of the first in the state to um, do body cams and just a lot of different actions um, in the state of Delaware have come out of the Smyrna Police Department. They've really done a good job with being able to um, make connections with the community, even though Smyrna is so small compared to some of our larger cities in Delaware. Um, I was just recommending that maybe we um, talk with um, Chief, I think it's James, is his last name, if we could talk with him as well. Absolutely. We'll also add him in. Um, I will, if you have, if there are ones that you think that we, you would like to be on, you know, in the discussion on this panel as we're trying to frame out how we're going to do November, then please um, um, let me know here. If you think about it afterwards, send us an email. I'll work with Chief Ogden to see if we can't reach out to um, make sure, right? And I'm trying to I'm trying to think through how we'll do this so we can hear from multiple voices and multiple panels. Maybe we might quickly, you know, in our time frame, try to do a couple different panels of people on maybe a couple different topics so that we can kind of hear from um, several voices and perspectives. Moderated session, Lynn. Yeah, I think it would also be useful to be able to do some good benchmarking on at least our top, you know, um, topics to find out what is the best of the best of what's being done other places in the country how many others are already doing it are we in the middle of the pack are we behind others some of that information is useful in terms of trying to make the case for the need for legislation when you can show uh -huh. you know positive yeah. outcomes in other areas or that the fact that so many others have already started doing it and we need to join them yeah, so that's a great point. Um, Sarah and Alexa, I know you're not on the screen, but you can hear me. Can you remind me in the December in the path forward that we add that we also um, compare us, benchmark us? And that, you know, again, it's because, you know, Lynn, I think we need to get closer. We may know for some vote as to what we think that's bubbling up and then, you know, really kind of dive in and research it when we have a better idea. Any other thoughts? before we open it up for public comment. Uh, this is yes. Reginald Daniel. Go ahead, Reginald. Uh, currently I'm working on, I'll have to try and send them another email, but I'd like to get the president of Noble at Delaware State University involved in this. I think having their input and having that student organization involved would be very helpful. Okay, can we talk about that offline? Absolutely. So we, we heard you, you would like to get, yeah, yeah we got you. <laughs> Gary, you were going to say something too? Yeah, Monica, I, the, on the task force sheet that Lynn sent us, if we could just go back, because I really like the, the recommendation that she pointed out, 4.3.2. I do not see that in my packet. Maybe I missed that page. I, my page starts at uh, 4.3.1. and I, oh, It's and on page, there. I see four, two, three, not four, three, two. Four, four point three. Did she say four point three point two? Is what I noted. Did I Mike get that? That's correct, Michelle. It's four point three point two, and it prints out at the top of my page, um, right after the C four point three recommendation. Okay, then I must be missing the page because my page starts at 43.1, then goes to 43.3. Yeah, maybe it's one in between. Yeah, I'll get one copy from you, Michelle. Okay. Or I'll go, I'll go, or I'll go back. Thank yep. you. I found all of them, which I will um, use and add the couple extra that Lynn added. I will look and see with 
if Chief Ogden has anything on it that the chiefs are working on to kind of be able to send out. And I want to tell you, as we're coming up on the public comment section, that I want to thank you again for, um, for um, the open dialogue and conversation around this. You know, this is a lot of work that we've been able to distill down that I think is getting us closer to some recommendations. Still got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, we are going to need your expertise. I think Elliot kind of pointed to us. We need to see what expertise exists within this group so that we know and what expertise we need to ask for that doesn't exist that's critical still for moving us forward and so we will be coming and following up with some of you all of you but some of you that actually said like i'm really like you know i'm good at the data piece or i can help um, facilitate some sessions or whatever it is okay sound like a plan okay well, I thank you um, again. I can't believe we accomplished this much in this um, period of time. I am ready, Sarah, to open it up to public comment. At this time, if you wish to give public comment, please utilize the raise hand function in Zoom. Members of the public may also give public comment by um, submitting an email to our task force email address, which is leotaskforce at delaware.gov. Again, that's leotaskforce at delaware.gov. Just wanna give it a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to see if anyone would like to utilize the raise hand function in order to give their, their public comment. Brianna Denby, you are now permitted to speak. You have two minutes. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you okay. so much. Great. I think that the work that you guys are all doing is amazing, and it's a really big topic. The word that I continue to hear repeatedly is the word transparency. And I think that is critically important. What I think was not mentioned during this call, but I think that this committee should look into is the idea of potentially publishing this Brady list. Um, and so what that is, is it's a list of officers who may have been accused of doing some actions that have been substantiated to amount to uh, uh, falsifying some information during their job duties. Um, the information is kind of quiet, hush, hush, and those within law enforcement are quite aware of what that is. And I think that the public could benefit by having that information. Um, and so I just ask that you guys at least look into and consider that as you continue the work on transparency within this committee. There, I'm sorry, can I ask one question? Can you just clarify, are you saying a Brady list? Brady, B-R-A-D-Y. Yeah, and, and so that term comes from a case, U.S. versus Brady. I think I was, I'm sorry, I think I was muted. I don't know if you heard my entire response. No, you, you um, I think you were, you wanna um, just clarify for me, thank you. So the term Brady list comes from a case, a US Supreme Court case, United States versus Brady, B-R-A-D-Y. So at this time, if anyone else would like to give public comment, please utilize the raise hand function in Zoom. Hey, Michelle, while we're waiting for the next comment, can I just chime in on something along those lines? 
So, so what? Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. So, another another list that's out there is the list of decertified officers. We have a list probably going back 20 years. And uh, I was on a call earlier today uh, with the Council on Police Training. They're going to establish a website. Right now, the Council on Police Training does not have its own standalone website. So that website will either be totally standalone or reside in the Secretary of Safety and Homeland Security site. Uh, but that's something to consider too, rather uh, officers that are have been decertified. And I can tell you, I sit on the Council Police uh, Training. There are Every time we meet, it seems like somebody is decertified and uh, that, that information is not put out there. And I don't know that the public's aware that we, that we decertify as many officers as we do. And are you feeding that information into the federal registry of decertified officers? It is, there is a federal registry, yes, and that is shared with them. Thank you. Sarah, do we still have any additional public comments? It doesn't appear there's anyone that would like to give public comment at this time. Great. You guys are amazing. No public. So any uh, um, final comments um, for the good of the cause? So we have a path forward. You will get information to vote on. We really going to need your skill sets. We're going to need all of us, right, to help to be able to get us to the finish line. We have a, a um, a map or a path, right, for what we think the next few months will look like. November's meeting, we will spend a significant, the majority of it will be some panels or some moderated sessions with law enforcement. And so if you, I'll probably send stuff out to you in advance if there are specific questions um, as we're coordinating that um, so that when it's moderated, so that they're already in queue. Um, because I think we should um, try to give them some heads up as to what the conversation and dialogue will be about. And we'll work with um, Sherry to help to coordinate that and um, Chief Ogden and um, Bushroller, look, you know, all of you, right? These are things, right? You can help us to be able to um, coordinate. And I think that is it for me for a good, for the for the cause. The only thing I would say, look, so it's on record. I just want to say um, earlier, Chief Ivan told us how I was going to say, you told us how many years you work for the state police and how many years you've been with University of Delaware. And I was going to say, you're trying to make us believe you're 35. <laughs> so anything else? If not, I want to say thank you again for your time. You got a few minutes back um, this evening. There's a lot of work in between. So um, have a good evening and thanks for joining. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.